When it was originally released in 1976, The Incredible Torture Show was met with considerable controversy and more than a few protests, including some organized by the group Women Against Pornography, WAP. Huh. I thought WAP stood for something else. <laughs> Welcome to Exploitation Reviews, and me, Rob, and today I'm taking a look at Bloodsucking Freaks from 1976. After buying and re-editing the film to restore some scenes that the director, Joel Reed, had cut out, Troma founder Lloyd Kaufman said, I may have possibly secured my place in hell by just watching it. It's very misogynistic. Today, we would not have anything to do with it. <laughs> Sounds pretty interesting. Let's check it out. But before we do, fair warning, this is a particularly nasty movie, and it's definitely not for everyone, and almost none of it can be shown here on YouTube, so you're going to have to spend more time than usual hanging out with me. But that should be fine. The film might be controversial, but I've had nothing but good experiences with WAPs. Meow. So, the story here is that Sardu runs a theater company. And his show, The Incredible Torture Show, works as follows. Sardu tells the guest that this is a SMN show of some sort, has nothing to do with reality, and then he brings out women who are tortured and killed, often with the help of his dwarf assistant, Ralphus. But here's the catch. The torture and murder is very much real. And I know what you're thinking. Hey, Rob, that sounds like the Herschel Gordon Lewis movie, The Wizard of Gore. And yeah, the two movies are kind of similar, but Joel Reed said he was mostly inspired by the Ilsa movies. So I guess Bloodsucking Freaks and The Wizard of Gore is kind of like when both Newton and Leibniz discovered calculus independently. <laughs> yeah, let's go with that comparison. Know your audience, Rob. Anyway, after one show, Sardu talks to a theater critic who is in attendance, and that critic says that he won't review third-rate magic shows. This displeases Sardu, and he promises that his next show will be his masterpiece, and it will include one of New York's most famous ballet dancers. Sardu's Lilliputian assistant kidnaps both the ballet dancer and that film critic and then brings them back to the theater and holds them captive. And once they arrive, we, the audience of the film, get to see a little bit more about what's happening backstage in Sardu's theater company, and boy, is it crazy. We first learn that Sardu makes most of his money by running a white slavery ring. Oh, hey, check it out. That Middle Eastern white slaver there is not an obese Anton LaVey, but actor Alfonso de Noble. You might know him from the proto-slasher Alice Sweet Alice. That's a really good film, by the way. You should track that down and watch it. Anyway, some other things we learn about Sardu's theater company is that he has a cage full of nude cannibal women. <laughs> yeah, that's a thing, and he has it. And no, I can't show you any of that here because, well, you know... They're nude and cannibal women, and before they enjoy their meal of a long pig, they like to rub bloody pieces of it all over themselves. YouTube doesn't like that. Nobody likes that. Does this sound like your movie yet? No? Well, let me sweeten the pot. We also get to see one of Sardu's other side hustles. People pay him so that they can torture and sometimes kill women he has captured. And I know what you're thinking, hey, Rob, wait a minute, isn't that the plot of Eli Roth's film Hostel? And, well, here's the thing, if you get the DVD or Blu-ray of Bloodsucking Freaks, you can hear a commentary by Eli Roth. And this uh, paid uh, torture scene in the movie here is where the trauma title Bloodsucking Freaks comes from. A man drills into a woman's head, and then he puts a straw in there, and then he sucks out some of her brains, which is really gross. I hate listening to people use straws. <laughs> Have I mentioned this film is a comedy? Well, this scene will prove it. Sardu and his friend Ralphus, they share a beer, and then they play a game of darts. And their dartboard is uh, painted on a woman, and uh, I can't show you which body part it's painted on, but I can tell you I have always hated that Van Morrison song, Brown-Eyed Girl. Bullseye coming up. <laughs> anyway, this movie isn't for everyone. Oh, but before I forget, there is actually a story here. The boyfriend of the ballet dancer that's been kidnapped, uh, he hires this detective to try to find her. Will he be successful? Will Sardu's new theater piece be a smash hit? Well, this movie's pretty crazy, and no matter how you think it's going to end, I guarantee it's probably not that. But that's enough out of me as far as plot goes. Let's talk some highlights. 
Uh, Seamus O'Brien, the actor who plays Sardu, he is fantastic. This is one of the all-time great exploitation film roles. It's just pure trash camp. Amazing job. Sadly, shortly after this film was released, he was murdered. His murder didn't have anything to do with the film. It was just a, a home invasion, burglary gone wrong. Pretty sad. I also really like how this movie can go from horror to comedy, like, really quickly. And the comedy is pretty good. Obviously, this is not the kind of comedy that's going to hit with a lot of people. Most people, nearly, it's not going to hit with nearly any people. But for uh, the few of us out there who like it, there's a lot to like. For fans of trash cinema, there's really not much out there like this. At least, not that does it as well as this. <laughs> I mean, this movie is just completely unhinged madness. It's some sort of insane comic book come to life. But I wouldn't say the movie is perfect. Like a dwarf enjoying his job as a white slaver, it has some shortcomings. Well, some people, like Lloyd Kaufman, uh, find the movie to be pretty misogynistic. Honestly, I never really saw it that way. Uh, I guess because it is a comedy and it's so crazy, I could just never take it seriously. And you do kind of get the impression that this is a satire. In fact, Eli Roth says it's a parody of the New York theater scene. I don't really know anything about the New York theater scene, so I can't really speak on that. But watching this movie, for me at least, is pretty similar to watching a Serbian film. Yes, it's depraved and just insane, but you can tell that it's trying to say something. With both of those films, I don't really have the background knowledge to figure out what it's trying to say, but I can still tell it's trying to say something. I mean, you can tell that the film is operating on two levels. There's this service level, and then there's the subtextual level, and, you know, whatever nastiness is on that service level is in service of the subtextual one, so I don't really consider what's happening on the service level to be bad. You know, I don't take it to be a misogynistic film. The misogyny is in service of whatever point it's trying to make. I think. Anyway, it feels kind of silly doing a kind of literary analysis of a film called Blood Sucking Freaks, so let's move on. One point of criticism is a lot of the backstage areas of Sardu's theater are pretty plain and boring. I really like his sort of living quarters, these look lived in, uh, but the other scenes are, yeah, they're pretty boring to look at. I would much prefer if they also looked more lived in. I don't know, they need more decorations on the walls, some bric-a-brac, some sick accoutrements, if you will. You know, just something that, you know, tells more of a story here. 